my name is Naomi Gryczko and I'm a team member of Game Changer team at TechSoup Europe. And our guests are Naomi, Miriam and Isan from our great partners Artemis, an organization uh, based in France. Uh, so, uh, can I have your uh, Miriam? Naomi, yes, I see you, perfect. Hello. Uh, the second guest is uh, Jordi from RNTC, uh, another organization based in the Netherlands. Uh, but uh, before we jump into the uh, content of our webinar, and uh, I would like to just uh, tell you what to expect today. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron Mizak. I am the communication specialist and community builder with TechSoup, uh, but of course, working on the Game Changer project. Um, so uh, just to clarify, uh, for the purposes of this webinar, this webinar is really to build what we have done, but also provide us an opportunity to share with everybody uh, that we do have a camp coming up, that we do have limited space, and we're really hoping to get the right people to attend. Uh, so as we mentioned, the events uh, the dates are the 13th and 14th and the 20th and 21st, and we'll cover uh, a wide variety of, of information uh, specifically focused on uh, radicalization, on gamification, on social media campaigns, and then also providing everybody an opportunity to actually play the game uh, because we, of course, want to showcase uh, the work that we've done. Uh, and we also want to show um, the work that our partner Explore IT has done, which we have not spoken with, but we have a webinar next week that will, of course, be talking about that. Um, but if you go to our website, uh, you can find out more information. Uh, you can also contact us. Uh, our web, our our camp specific email is camp c a m p uh, at techsoup.org, um, and then our website is gamechangereu.org backslash camp. Um, so we'll definitely have more information there. Um, but also, we want to encourage those to apply. Uh, Noemi, if you can. So uh, the, the people that we're looking to have apply for this event are, are those of you that are working with uh, young people aged uh, 12 to 25. Uh, it's not to suggest that we can't work with older or younger people, but for the purposes of our project, that is our, that is our target audience. Uh, for those of you that want to uh, address the growing trend of radicalization uh, and polarization, as we know, this is obviously a, a problem in our in our growingly digital world um, and of course we want to do this through both online and offline um, games or different activities uh, and those of you that want to learn more about creating socially driven impactful campaigns um, so of course as we're discussing here we have online campaigns those that are done through social media but then of course we have other campaigns uh, that we'll talk about uh, next week and then over the course of our camp which focus on uh, offline what we call social city games uh, we'll also talk about some other games and some other elements that are really important in, in helping create that, that meaningful change. Uh, and then for those of you that want to, uh, or sorry, for those of you uh, that want to connect with others focusing on the topic of uh, polarization uh, with NGOs and CSOs. So again, uh, we really view this event as an opportunity to uh, network and to meet others. So I, I will stop there and I will pass it off to back to Noemi. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, thank you. So, and now is this moment when I will uh, ask uh, actually um, our partner, uh, Jordi from RNTC uh, to uh, share his expertise and to tell us a little bit more about the rad radicalization and what this uh, crazy snake games is, snake game is about. How to understand better this uh, radicalization phenomena and what, uh, Jordi, are you going to teach us during your session, which will take place just in three weeks? So the floor is yours. Please share your screen. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, I will start sharing my screen. Um, so thank you. Um, my name is Jordi. I work for RNTC Media Training Center and we're based in the Netherlands. Um, we train a variety of people varying from journalists, uh, media makers, NGOs, CSOs, young people. Um, and pretty much our focus is on behavioral change and uh, good quality journalism. Um, within the scope of this project, um, 
we have developed a variety of tools. Um, we've worked with the cool young campaigners on the ground. Um, we trained them up um, and we, we constantly improved our curriculum based on their experiences. Um, and just to continue Aaron's sales pitch, uh, when you join the camp, you will get access to all this material. So um, we've developed a training handbook, for example, um, simple, easy to understand exercises, um, but all linked to very important questions. So they're linked to radicalization, they're linked to um, how to provide an alternative narrative, how to build a campaign, um, and how to actually implement campaigns like that. Um, so these handbooks are just an easy tool um, to understand how to actually build something with impact. Um, next to that, uh, we've developed a big canvas. I will show it at the end of this uh, part of the webinar. Um, and that's, that's a very visual tool where you can just build campaigns. Um, it's all based on um, research, um, on best practices, but also on other learning. Um, and also the research will be available for you when you join CAMP. Next to that, all the, all the slide decks and trainer materials will be made available. Um, so if you work for an NGO or CSO, um, you can implement this training yourself. Um, there's a guidebook that goes along with it, um, just to make it as easy as possible to build campaigns with a, for social good and with an impact. Um, within this project, we've um, had campaigns in France. We saw the beautiful example just yet. Um, there was also campaigns run in Poland, in Greece, um, but we've also used this material um, for campaigners in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, and all the campaigns that were developed based on this um, curriculum, this methodology, um, they were on a variety of topics. So it's not that we were saying um, you have to do something on radicalization, or we can also address push and pull factors. Um, we can address things like racism, um, social cohesion. Um, there was a campaign based on um, environmentalism and youth participation. Um, and I think for me, that's, that's, that's the key message here. Um, as NGO workers, you can't force your ideas or beliefs onto young people because they, they, ha they have a better understanding of what's happening in their communities. They have a better understanding of what they want to address. And if you force things on young people, it will never work. So this entire curriculum is based on the idea that we just give them the skills and tools to do something meaningful, um, but they have to um, be creative and think about the solutions themselves. Um, so they become owner of the product. They become owners of the campaign. Um, and of course, there are a lot of things happening. Um, if we look at the continent of Europe alone, um, we've got Brexit, um, uh, we've got climate change, the so-called migrant crisis. Um, um, COVID recently happened, a lot of unrest um, started there. Um, and of course, young people, they know and understand these issues and they know they are slightly linked to radicalization or more radical behavior. Um, so that's also where our approach um, linked to radicalization comes from. So when we talk about radicalization within this project, it's not about um, people who will go out into the streets tomorrow with a gun um, for a terrorist attack. Um, it's about um, developing more extreme ideas and polar ideas. So it's, it's not about the hardcore fundamentalists, it's about radicalization in the sense that there's a strong us versus them worldview. There's a strong polarization within the community or society. Um, and of course, this polarization can lead to hate speech, intolerance, violence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think um, what we often see with these big EU funded projects, is, it's that the aim is to, um, to take these hardcore radicals back from the fringe of, radical, of, of radicalizing um, and becoming violent. Um, personally, I don't think that's, that's the way to go. I don't think that, that, that we can ask from young people or NGOs that they are in charge of that. 
um, governments are already struggling to get there. Um, so why, why, why should a young person um, take that role upon them? Um, but what we can do uh, with media, with communications, with stories, with campaigns, um, is to pull them back a bit, to just decrease the temperature of a discussion, um, to offer something positive that provides people with an alternative to grasp up, up onto. Um, and to make that idea clear, um, it is important to understand an audience of a campaign. So what are the push and pull factors that are in play? Why are, becoming people, are become, people becoming more and more radical in their thinking, but also in their behavior? Um, you quite often see that it comes from push and pull factors. So a push factor, for example, is something that's, that's, that forces people uh, to think more radically. It comes um, from a socio-economical perspective, for example, um, but also something that's happening in their communities or in their lives. So maybe discrimination is the cause of their problem. Um, maybe they are frustrated to get out of poverty. On the other hand, people who radicalize, they also have something very positive they aspire to. So they want to become powerful. They want to become a hero. Um, they want to go on an adventure. And most often you see that they just want to belong. They just want to find a community that agrees with them and they can have some importance in that community. Um, what's very powerful about the Game Changer project is that um, um, the young people, they know their communities. I think the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of this uh, project is very powerful. It's very strong. Um, they understand these pool and pool factors better than we do. Uh, so we just need to scale them up and give them the tools to make an impact, a positive impact themselves to become game changers. Um, and to make this a bit more visual, um, I always use this example. So there's, there's a lot of research done on radicalization. Um, and as NGO members and CSO members, we often struggle with defining radicalization. Um, what are the factors that are in play? Um, how do people get there? What's the radicalization pathway? Um, and to make this a bit easier and understandable, and also to make it visual to see how we can move on this board, um, I want to use this slide. And it's, of course, everyone knows this game. It's uh, snakes and ladders or shoots and ladders. Um, and the goal is to finish at square 100. Um, and when you end up on a ladder, you can move up the board quickly. Um, and when you end up on a snake, you have to go down. If we think about terrorism and extremism, it often comes from strong interests and opinions and ideas. So people have these push and pull factors. They want to do something. Um, so they start flirting with the ideas. They start to play this game. They want to move up that game. Um, and maybe someone who's very passionate about something can become an activist. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when people end up in the higher regions of this board, they might become a bit more extreme. They might even become te a terrorist. Um, so if a square, 100 would represent a terror attack um, and we want to play this game, um, we have to make sure that they don't reach square number 100. Um, and the, when people move on this board, um, certain events in their private lives, but also stories and um, communities can force them to move, them, move up rather quickly. Um, uh, Take 9-11, for example. A lot of um, um, aspiring radicals, they moved up this board rather quickly after the attacks. Uh, but also a lot of people moved down during these attacks. So stories and ideas um, and narratives and, um, um, uh, are, are very important when people move on this board. A campaign can also be, play a, a role in this board, of course. A campaign can um, intervene in this process. We can put up new stories. 
we can give up, give people the idea that they belong to a community that's more constructive and more positive. Um, so if we want to build a campaign, we have to play this game and we have to understand why people move up quickly um, and we have to develop ideas to make sure that people move down as well. Uh, so this thinking is core of uh, the entire curriculum we have developed. Uh, we're going to become a game changer um, by moving people down on the board, by decreasing the temperature of discussions, by giving people an alternative, by um, helping them down um, instead of up. Um, and again, I think what's, what's, what's most important for me is that, that as an NGO or CSO who wants to implement a training like this or who wants to build campaigns with young people, um, is that, you, that, that you're just there to give them the tools and skills to make a difference themselves. Um, they understand narratives and stories better than we do. Um, they understand what is happening in a local context instead of we. Um, we just have to make sure that they, they have the proper skills, tools, techniques to make an impact themselves. Um, so this was just a teaser about our thinking um, about radicalization, about why it's important to play a game. Um, during the camp, we will dive into a couple of specific issues um, and specific techniques to get people to build powerful campaigns. Um, this is the canvas we were talking about, and there are 13 steps to get to a campaign idea or a campaign outline um, that can make an impact. Um, again, this will be all made available to you all. Um, but on camp, we will uh, look at square number one, and we will also look at square number eight and 13. So we're going to talk about target audiences and why it's important. Uh, but we're also going to look at powerful campaign messages that can have a measurable impact. Um, in the end, you should be able to do it yourself, but I would strongly suggest to sign up for a camp um, and we can have some nice discussions about uh, the curriculum. Um, I can show you how to um, do the activities. Um, and of course, you'll be given access to everything we've developed. Back to you, Noemi. Thank you, Jordi. This was very inspirational. Thank you for sharing these uh, thoughts and for encouraging our participants to join your session. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> so now I would like to ask you to ask some questions and some comments on the chat. Uh, we have our panelists still with us. So please shoot a question. Jordi, I see one question and one comment. Uh, Firko said, we are the snake <laughs> and the smile. <laughs> and well, sometimes we have to be the snakes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> How did young people determine what issue to address? Um, so so that's, that's, that's part of the group dynamic quite often. Um, and sometimes that can become pretty, well, not violent, but there are a lot of discussions around what to address. Um, most of the time, uh, it goes rather smoothly. So, so um, um, especially young people, they already have something that drives them, um, something they find very important to tackle. Um, so, and I think that's, that's the cool thing, that there, there's a lot of variation in the topics they've been addressing. Um, interestingly enough, um, we've used this a lot um, and environment always pops up. So the environment is something that young people really care about. Um, but also um, um, unfairness, so it could be in the form of uh, discrimination, uh, but also about uh, youth participation. That's, that's also something that, that pops up often. 
Thank you. So yeah, it's, it's, um, there are some exercises in the curriculum um, and in the end it's, it's a decision they have to make. So it's also about um, conflict resolution. How do you make a decision on what issues to uh, address? Yeah. And not only what issues to address, but also which platform to use. So uh, do you have any recommendation or comments uh, so on what platform young people should use for their campaigns? Um, young, young people should use the platform they can find their target audience on. Um, I will also be talking about this in the sessions, but it, it makes no sense to start a campaign on Instagram if you want to talk to all the older people, because you will probably, you won't find older people on Instagram. Uh, maybe Twitter or your local newspaper is a better bet. Um, so it depends on your target audience. If you want to create something that's realistic, um, and you want to talk to your peers, then um, by all means use Instagram or even TikTok. Um, if you want to, um, if you have a target audience uh, based on millennials, like most of the people in this panel, um, probably you should go to Facebook. I see, thank you. And to ask, uh, one last question. So how uh, long should be a social media campaign? Like? Difficult questions. Um, I, I know again, only that's, difficult questions. Yeah, that's good. That yeah, keeps it interesting. Um, again, again that, that totally depends on your goal. Um, so if you just want to create a couple of memes and reach a million people, then probably a week is enough if you've got a very good meme. Um, if you want to be, uh, become or have something that's more structural and more... Um, fundamental, then probably you have to get paid for six months. It totally depends. Um, based on, on, on everything we touched upon, you can create campaigns varying from a day to years. Depends on the goals. Thank you. So uh, Jordi mentioned TikTok, Facebook and Instagram. So during the camp, we will have a hands on uh, sessions, uh, so called media lab about those platforms, how to create uh, the assets, how to measure, how to check the metrics, uh, uh, what to how to deal with those um, especially TikTok, uh, new technologies. So we do invite you to join also those sessions. And uh, talking about the camp, let me uh, ask Hania now to share a little bit more uh, insight about uh, how to join the camp. My name is Hania Hanka Nowicka, and as you already heard, this webinar is just the beginning of our adventure with uh, speakers from all over all over the world and possibilities of networking for more than 50 organizations from all over Europe. So you can join the camp still. The deadline for now is still tomorrow, so hurry up. And I would also like to tell you what is the benefit from joining the camp. So what is after this? So after our unconference, four days online event, you will have the possibility as an organization to take part in so-called dissemination phase. What do we mean by this? We have, with our partners, we have the enormous experience with conducting and playing some games, social city games and online games based on, uh, based on the topics or around the topics which were determined by youth, just as you saw the campaigns. Uh, and we have this tool. We would like to encourage many organizations whose work is relevant to ours uh, to test it, to take it with them, but f to, to adjust it for their needs and to, to use it for their purposes. So we are open for any support you would need after the camp. We can offer you trainings on these games. We can offer you consultancy. So to check if the games are ready to go for you or if you need to adjust them for your purposes. And last but not least, we also offer, offer you the financial support, which we mean as a compensation for work days devoted to, to the games. So all the organization will 
be able to apply uh, after joining the camp for this support and many grants, which I totally encourage you to take part in. And of course, we are also open to provide you the support in online campaigns, in social media campaigns, which was the subject of this webinar. So please, please take it in mind, think it through, slip it over, you have still one night, and go to the website gamechangereu.org and apply for the camp. Thank you so much. Share this information with a friend, with a friend spread through all the organizations you know that their work is relevant, which work with youth, and see you there. This event it will be highly interactive and we do um, encourage people uh, not only during the camp to interact, to participate in different sessions, but also today you can ask us questions. Uh, and uh, our first, our first uh, speaker will be Naomi uh, in a dialogue with our special guest. Uh, so Naomi, I will stop sharing my screen and I believe you are in France. Am I right? Where exactly? In Paris. In Paris, lucky you. <laughs> so hello everyone, uh, I am Naomi, I'm from the association uh, NGO Artemis. Uh, I work um, with Miriam, Miriam, who's also here today. Uh, Artemis is an NGO specialized in the prevention of radicalization. Uh, it was created in 2005. Uh, and our activities, our main activities um, are the follow-up of individuals on the brink of radicalization, as well as the training of professionals uh, in the follow-up of individuals um, in the brink of radicalization. Um, since 2018, we've also uh, developing, we've also been developing education um, and campaign activities for the youth, uh, working on media literacy, empowerment, and critical thinking. Uh, so that's how we started the campaign uh, that I will talk to you about today. But first, I want to introduce Isan, who's here with us today, and who led the campaign, the social media campaign that we're going to present. Uh, and we, I'm gonna, we're going to have a discussion, but you can also ask her questions uh, at the end of, the, of my presentation. So first, today, like I said, I'm going to talk to you about this campaign that was led by four 16 years old um, from their whole high school students um, in collaboration with uh, Artemis and the Game Changer Partners. So the campaign was led uh, on Instagram and the, the aim was to fight against um, racism and hate, and hate speech against the LGBTQ plus community. So that's just a glimpse on the slide of what the campaign looked like, uh, but I will also go in depth um, afterwards on the Instagram feed. But first I was, I'm going to discuss uh, more about the context of how and why we started this campaign and how it's incorporated in the activities of Artemis, uh, along with a small quiz. Oh, that's just a picture of uh, two of our um, uh, students that worked on the campaign. So why did we start the campaign? So like I said, Artemis has an expertise on disinformation and hate speech online. So we have uh, Artemis is organizing workshop with the youth about uh, fake news, conspiracy theories, uh, hate speech. That's one of the, uh, that's a photograph actually from one um, of our workshop. And because there's a lot of focus on the negative side of social media uh, in those workshops, we wanted to talk about um, positive alternative discourses um, as they offer different messages. Uh, and yeah. So first, I just want to do a small quiz on hate speech. And you can answer me on the chat 
So, how many people go on Instagram daily in France? A, 3.5 million, B, 11.5 million, and C, um, 30.5 million. Hold on, I'm trying to read at the same time. Okay. I'm seeing B's, I'm seeing C, not of A. Um, well, Isan, you were right. Oh, someone said A, okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Okay, so Isan was right, it was B, it's 11.5 uh, million. That's just to show you like why we use also Instagram because there's a lot of people going on it daily. And that's just like people that go, not people that post on it. Yeah. yeah. So how big is the next one is how big is the problem of hate speech in France? Give me the percentage of hate speech in online messages as for March 2020? So 2%, 14% or 50%? Someone said A, 2%, someone said 50%. Is there someone that think it's maybe 14%? Did everyone answer? Because I, I don't know if I'm seeing everything. Okay, well, the answer was uh, B, actually. I only saw two answers, which was A or C, and it's, uh, it's B, 14%. So, yeah. You're the you're right, <laughs> now that I've said the answer. <laughs> Congrats. Uh, and the final question, in the first trimester of uh, 2020, how messages with hate speech, how many messages, and I've given the answer, that's great. Wait, hold on. <laughs> okay, well that was 9.6 million, because I just gave it the answer. Um, and it's a lot. Yep, I think, I don't know, okay, my computer is not working, so. It's fine. Okay. So like I said, um, with the issue of hate speech, like I showed you with these numbers and the questions, we wanted to deal with it uh, in a well-argued and alternative, uh, positive way uh, with a social media campaign. And so the I'm going now to present the campaign and more on the, on the Instagram feed uh, of the, the campaign, but I'm going to let Isan, she was talking about the Rosa Parks one specifically that she used an image, uh, cause she, a photograph, because she thought uh, it was more powerful. Uh, she was specifically working on the anti-racism campaign because, so the campaign, there was one Instagram account, but two themes. Uh, like I said, LGBT and anti-racism. So Isan was specifically working on anti-racism. Uh, so I'm assuming that she also did the one on Rosa Parks that you, she did Rosa Parks that you see on the screen. I'm assuming she did uh, Malcolm X. I think the um, one on the bottom left is also on racism. 
and there's one with Angela Davis. So maybe I can say for her, for her that she used uh, mainly icons that are known, like anti-racism icons that are known to the greater public, maybe to make a bigger uh, impact. Um, then also here, as you see, there's uh, one on Mandela. Uh, there's also one on blackface. Um, so I think that was also uh, Isan. And this was everything um, on, in Canva, right? So she uh, searched for the photos and then uploaded to the canvas and made the post, right? Yeah, these were the results. So there were 60 posts uh, in general in the, on the Instagram uh, feed, 24 on LGBT, 29 on anti-racism, 11 on discrimination uh, in general, uh, two on COVID-19, which were also related to racism uh, against um, the Asian community, Chinese community during uh, COVID-19. So they've merged the two topics together. And average view on post was 2020, 2,220. Um, now I want to talk about the collaboration that we had with the media PR sector, the Mission Ambassador of Change, and the network that we created and how we built uh, this network. So for the campaign, um, the four that we called Ambassador of Change, which is the students uh, that led the campaign. Uh, the ambassadors were supported uh, by consultants working in the PR and the communication um, sector. Um, and that was really helpful, I think, for them, uh, because uh, when she joined the project, our consultant really motivated them um, she gave them tips, uh, she raised an uh, issue with them, and she helped them on the frequency of posting, on the, on the reach of their post, on the use of uh, tags and, hash and hashtags. So that was really helpful to lead the campaign, to have a consultant and someone who's an expert in communication. Uh, but we've also had other workshops uh, on Canva, for example, um, that was some of that was some pictures from trainings, uh, and that was one on Canva, who I think Jordi is going to talk about about it more a little bit, um, and that was really helpful for them uh, to create their campaign, to have their goals, uh, to have their themes. Um, so that was a really uh, helpful tool for us, but also they used uh, Canva to create their post on Instagram, like Noemi said. Um, so it's a free website um, that has templates for Instagram and that helped them create this. Um, and that was one of the, Canva was one of the tools that was presented to us during uh, our trainings. And also I want to show you this because this is when the black owl represents when, um, when the consultant and the expert joined the project because um, they joined later on, especially our, our consultant on communication. And you can see that from the black arrow, the daily activity on the Instagram account really uh, raised. Uh, and was more, it was more proactive. 